it's good to have you all here today. We've changed the seating up a little bit. <laughs> well, we're trying to pull everyone together instead of having us all spread apart. And it, it seems to work today. We're all over here in this one section. So I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to walk over here today. I might have to stay to the right. <laughs> That's a good place, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we we all get the feeling sometimes the anointing is always on one side of the church than the other side, and that's where we sit. But it, trust me, it works just the same on the other. <laughs> oh, gotcha. <laughs> no, we wanted to try to, since we're kind of getting over all this stuff in the world, trying to bring things a little bit back to normal and because uh, we're, we're all about relationships. And when we're spread out, it's hard to... I mean, we can still build the relationships. We've been doing really well. But, um, yeah, it's just nice to be closer to family. So anyway, welcome home. Glad you're all here. Glad Gene and Randy got over this stuff. Amen. And Zachary, too. Good to see y'all here. Just want to mention, you know, as we're going into worship this morning, I'll, uh, I'll mention this probably again before the end of the service, but uh, we want to have a water baptism. And if you're interested in being baptized in water, let me know and we'll get you scheduled and uh, we will take care of that. And uh, it's not just for adults, it's for young people too. So uh, if it's if they're interested, I know my wife had a couple of them say something in children's church about being baptized in water. So uh, that happened the same day that we were, I mentioned it just in passing over here. It was kind of like, oh, wow, well, this is a good thing. God's working amongst us and working and uh, drawing people closer to him. And it's water baptism is our step of faith, declaring I am following after God. And uh, I am a new creature in Christ and going to be living that way now forever. Amen. Also coming up is the big harvest festival down in town, Seebeck. And our big town back down there by the water. Anyway, that's coming up the 31st. If you haven't already brought in some candy and you would like to donate, we still got another Sunday. If you'd like to put some of the bags together, and what we're doing is we're putting... Um, candy in a, in a bag. We've got to track the simple steps to, uh, to peace with God. It's based off of the adult version, the simple steps um, to peace with God by Billy Graham, but it's made for kids and a little cartoon track. Uh, I'm excited. I love, I love the track, but it's a great track for, for being for, for adults that have children or grandchildren and you just want to flip through the pages and talk to them. It has a scripture and what the step is and it's a great witnessing tool for your grandkids or your, your kids or whatever um, to be able to share the good news with them and lead them into a relationship with God because that's our duty, isn't it? We are to, to talk about Christ and our going in and our coming out of our houses and to each generation. So if you'd like to put some of those bags together, see my wife, she's got all the stuff for that. We brought, we got the tracks, we got the bags. We got some candy out there already, so we can get started this week if you'd like to do that at home and just kind of work it in. Um, also coming up, yeah, I wanted to say June. It is November 13th. Now that sounds like a long ways off, doesn't it? But it's only three weeks. It's only three weeks. But we are going to be honored to have Don Ross, our district superintendent, coming in. He's going to be our guest speaker. I've been trying for three years now <laughs> to get him. The, the first one he had to cancel. The second one is our first COVID outbreak. <laughs> and I had to cancel because of that. Because we had several that were out and... Uh, everything is okay. I talked to them on the phone just this week. They're still scheduled. He's looking forward to being out here with us. and So that's going to be exciting. Hey Amen. Well, with all those announcements out of the way, let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? 
Father, we thank you for watching over us this week. Thank you for getting us over this sick stuff. Thank you for keeping us safe and healthy. Thank you for putting a roof over our head, food on our table. Thank you for giving us a means of income, Father. And we just want to say that we love you today. We love you not just because of the things you do for us, but because you have saved us. You brought us into a relationship with you. Lord, we don't want to take that for granted. Lord, we want to serve you. We love you. So as we worship you this morning, hear our praise. Lift us up, Father. Encourage us and change us into your children. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together.
into the shadow. Your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I hate you. Jesus Christ, I live 
through the fires and challenges that we faced. You've never left us nor forsaken us, but you've been there with us, walking alongside with us through those times. And even though we know, according to your word, sometimes we don't feel like you're there with us, but Lord, thank you for your reassurance today. Thank you for the reassurance of your word. The promise is you're with us no matter what. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes that we might see the wonderful truths of your word. That we would hide those truths in our heart. Apply them to our lives. Lord, we've come to meet with you this morning. Thank you for, for being here with us. We pray for our missionaries that are scattered throughout the world, Father. We ask that you would give them favor in the lands in which they're serving in. Give them favor with the governments. Give them favor in the communities in which they're serving. And help them to win souls for you. We pray for those that are in service of our country. Some are serving in harm's way, Father. We ask that you would send your mighty warring angels just to totally surround them and keep them safe. That you protect them. That you'd be with their families here at home. Letting them know that you are with them. Lord, I pray that wherever they happen to be, that there will be other Christians that come alongside of them to encourage those that are that are Christian, but also for those that don't have a relationship with you, that they will you let their light shine wherever they happen to be and lead others into a relationship with you as well. Let them know that their families here at home are praying for them. Let them know that there are others that are joining our hearts and our spirits together, praying for their safety, for them to come home safe. Lord, we just want to say thank you. We've come with expectant hearts to meet with you, so change us. Or yes, he sings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, open up your Bibles. We've been studying the last several weeks in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, looking at the gifts of the Spirit. We looked at all nine of the gifts. We looked at the gifts of revelation. The gifts of revelation were the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits. We looked at the gifts of miracles, and those are the gift of miracles, the gifts of healing. Um, what's the other one? Gift of power. Pardon? Faith, there we go. Yeah. That one was slipping my mind for whatever reason. Um, but the gift of faith. And then we looked last couple weeks at the vocal gifts. And the vocal gifts were the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, and the gift of interpretation in tongues. We learned that God gave us those gifts through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Right? And how we are to use those to reach out into our community. Well, today I want you to open up your Bibles to the Old Testament. Over to the book of Joel, chapter 1. It's a minor prophet, so it's going to be towards the end 
of your uh, Old Testament, the book of Joel, chapter 1. We're going to look at both chapters 1 and chapter 2 today and focus in on those. But like I know many of you have commented before, you like to know a little bit of the history of how, where all this fits in, what's happening, uh, just to make better sense of what's going on. Joel wrote during a long time period, because we don't know when the book of Joel was written. Just to be uh, open about that, they have it anywhere from 900 B.C. to 350 B.C. That's a huge gap in time, isn't it? A little over or under 600 years. Uh, when I see big gaps in that, I kind of just go for the center. <laughs> but there are some hints about when that book was written, um, just from things that are mentioned throughout the text, uh, such it mentions uh, the Greeks, it mentions Assyria, it mentions Babylon, uh, those types of things. So we can kind of, most scholars uh, put it at around seven, oh, about 787, somewhere in that area. Um, they put it that time because it was um, before Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed. And this is the, the first temple was destroyed um, before the time of Christ. So anyway, that's kind of where they put it. Who was his uh, contemporaries? Well, if we put it at that time period, his contemporaries, meaning those who were uh, prophesying during his time, Joel was a minor prophet, meaning he was, um, wasn't the main well-known prophet during that time period. He's, he was still anointed of God. He was still carrying the message. But the main prophets were Ezekiel, Jeremiah. Um, I think Nahum was also around this time period. So those are the people that are his contemporaries, that they're walking around the, uh, the countryside of Israel. All right. Well, at 922, just to kind of refresh our minds about uh, what was happening in the Old Testament, Israel, well, we weren't being very faithful to God. In fact, after living under prosperity with King David, King Saul, and uh, King Solomon, the nation was divided. You had ten tribes going to the north, the northern tribes, or um, Israel. Then you had two tribes that were in the south, which included uh, the city of Jerusalem, and uh, that was known as the southern kingdom or Judah. So when you're reading through and you see Judah and Israel, they're the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. Now, along comes during this time period, the people get worse and worse. They're not serving God. They're not uh, obeying his commandments. They're not uh, following the law of Moses. So the one that was particularly the worst was the first that was judged. And those were what? The northern tribe, which was Israel. Ten tribes that stayed into the north, right? And they were judged by having a country called Assyria come in and conquer the northern tribes. Now, wh who is Assyria? The Assyrians were those who lived in southern Turkey and northern Iran. Okay, northern Iran. They made up the Assyrians, and they were the strong power at that time. They came in, and they conquered um, Israel, the northern tribes, took some of them into captivity, left some there, but they also supplanted some of their own people from the known Samaritan area, or Assyria, into the country of Israel or the northern kingdom. Now, that led to the obvious. These people 
the Assyrians, also called Samaritans, because the Samaritans were also, uh, Assyria was known as Samaria because their capital was Samaria. All right. So they, um, the Samaritans and the Jewish people who lived in the northern kingdom intermarried, and that didn't end up very good at all. Why? Because, well, it intermingled the beliefs of Judaism along with the beliefs of the Samaritans who worshipped other idols. And the Jews were no good Jews, and they weren't good Gentiles either. <laughs> and if you remember, Gentiles are those who are not Jews. So in their book, in the Jewish people's eyes, especially to the ultra-Orthodox Jewish people, they believed that these Samaritans were the children of the devil, okay? They were just pagans, and they would have absolutely nothing to do with them. And that carried through even during the time of Jesus, when he went to the northern area around the Sea of Galilee and was preaching. Um, he met a Samaritan woman, and they came up with that discussion at the well, right? So now we know where the Assyrians were. Well, they served or over the, the people of Israel, the northern tribe, for roughly about a hundred years, give or take. After a hundred years, along comes another power, and that's the Babylonians. Babylonians were from where? Do you remember? Babylon. Babylon. That was the, the capital of their city, yes, Babylon. Well, that, they came from Iraq. Modern-day Iraq would have been the Babylonians. And that's where Babylon is today. They've been rebuilding the city and excavating it and all that. Um, the Babylonians, when they came in, they conquered the Assyrians. They also conquered the northern tribe, but they went a little bit further. And this time, instead of just the northern tribes being judged because of their wickedness, the southern kingdom or, or Judah was being judged at the same time. Now here, Babylon, in order to uh, assure that they had obedience in the country, they took captive the leadership of Israel. They left some there, but they took the majority of the people with them back to their country of Iraq or Babylon. And uh, it's there that they would have taken um, Daniel would have taken the, the, uh, any of the children of the, uh, the king, anyone in leadership would have been taken to Babylon. They left, what they, who they did leave is they left the everyday worker, the ones that worked the fields, those types of things, so that those fields would still produce and bring food into the kingdom. They took everyone in leadership and anyone who is anybody took them into Babylon. After about 70 years, the Babylonians were conquered. And they were conquered by who? Assyria, Babylon, and then who? I'm sorry, I didn't hear Jenny. The Medes and Persians, yes. The, they were they were conquered by the Persians, who is the predominant group. The Persians are the people of modern-day Iran. Okay? They were the largest country in the Middle East at that time, and they still are an extremely large country. They were directly east of the land of Palestine. You had the Palestinians, the Syrians came down from this way conquered, then you had Babylon, which was kind of in the middle of them. And then you had the Persians over on the far side. Now, the Persians did one thing that was kind of cool for the Israelites. And that's that they eventually let the people that were in captivity in Babylon go back to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple and reestablish their beliefs. Now, all this happened for them to be judged because they were sinning against God. They were rebelling against God. They weren't being obedient to him. 
So he brought judgment and war to judge the unrighteous. Okay. Now, when they, uh, the good thing that came out of this is that even though they went on the cycle of the Old Testament, you see them serving God, rebelling against God, a judgment comes, they repent, they come back to God. That cycle was finally broken by the time the Babylonians came in. So when they went back to their temple and they started to rebuild it in Israel, from that point on, the Israelites, both the northern and southern kingdoms, really did not turn away from their God. They were firm in their beliefs. And then, so when the, after them came the, the Greeks and the Romans, when they came in, they did not give in on their beliefs. They didn't worship the other idols. They didn't merge with other beliefs. They were very staunch and, and hard and firm in their stance with their God. They were no longer wavering back and forth. They did go overboard and getting legalistic, but they were worshiping their God. And that's the, the setting that Jesus enters into when he's born. Now, why do I say all of that? Well, it's that with those kingdoms coming in, conquering and all, that's what Joel is talking about in this prophecy. So with your Bibles open to Joel chapter 1. Let's begin reading in verse number one. It says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders, give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children. And another generation. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust has left, the destroying locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and sleep, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree, has stripped off the bark and thrown it down. Their branches were made white. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn, the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed and the, mount and the ground mourns because the grain... Eh. There it is. Because the grain is destroyed and the wine dries up and the oil languishes. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil, wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because of the harvest in the field, has perished. The vine dries up. The fig tree languishes, languishes. Pomegranate, palm, and apple, all the trees of the field are dried up, and gladness dries up from the children of man. You see here, the locusts that come in are symbolic of these countries that we just looked at, Samaria, Assyria, Babylon. All those are going to come in and conquer are symbolic of the locusts. And at the time of this writing, Joel is writing because there's a great invasion of locusts that actually took place in Israel. And God told them specifically, this is of me. Now it's hard to imagine that a plague of locusts is of God. But keep in mind, they were rebelling against God. And it said right off that, that those locusts, what? Hear the voice of the Lord. This is what I'm, I'm doing, right? So he's bringing in these locusts, these different armies that are coming in. They're going to be like locusts, swarming over the land, destroying anything that would have come in their way. This disaster of this locust invasion was the foreshadowing, if you will, of the coming day of the Lord, the great and terrible day of the Lord, the day that judgment would be coming across the entire world. 
It wasn't just a foreshadowing of these countries coming in and conquering Israel, but it was also a foreshadowing of what's going to happen in the book of Revelation on the great and terrible day of the Lord during the time of tribulation where mankind is being judged for their unbelief in God. The message of the locust invasion was commissioned by God. We see that in verse number one. But what was the purpose? Well, the purpose was to arouse the people to turn and seek to the Lord. There's a charge that was given to several groups there. The charge was to this. The first charge was to the leaders, verse number two through four, to the leaders and to its citizens. And they said, here, listen, pay attention to what's happening. Hear and listen. He said, what the cutting locusts, excuse me, verse 2. Hear this, you elders, give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your father? Has there been such a devastation of a plague? Has there been such uh, overwhelming desolation happening in all of Israel that you could never remember? You see, when the locusts came in, they ate and devoured everything. And what one group left, the next group of locusts ate. And after what they left, the other group of locusts ate. The disaster was unequaled, unparalleled. The disaster and its lessons was to be shared with future generations. The disaster was successful, successive series of uh, invasions. Just like the invasions of the locusts, this invasion would come in and give about total destruction. A picture of thorough, all-inclusive judgment. There was a charge not only to the elders, but to those who were indulgent, who drank a lot. And they were told in verses 5 through 7 to wake up and weep. Get out of your slumber. The disaster, in other words, had ruined the wine and snatched it from their lips. Those that, that were drinking and, and partying like there was tomorrow, well, all of that is gone. The invading army or the, the, notion, the nation of locusts was fierce. It was powerful. It was innumerable. And it destroyed the entire economy, vineyards, the fig trees, devastating all tried, trade that could happen. It basically stripped everything bare. The economy was so bad that they, what money they had couldn't buy anything because there was nothing to buy. There was nothing there. Then there was a charge to the young and old. And what were they told to do? They were told to mourn like a virgin over the loss of her fiancé. Verses 8 through 10. The opportunity to worship God through offerings and sacrifices were gone. They no longer could do their order of worship because if, if you sinned, you would go to the temple and you would give a certain grain offering. You would give a certain offering of uh, a bird or an animal. But all of that was gone. You couldn't worship God in the way that you had. Those opportunities were destroyed. The privilege of bringing the grain offerings and the portion of meat offerings to the priests was gone. So the privilege of supporting the priests were gone. The crops of the field were ruined. All grain and wine and oil were gone. Then they charged the farmers to despair, to be ashamed, to wail. The harvest of the field was ruined. The vineyards, the trees were withered. They were dried up. The joy of people had left them and withered away like the fruit. Then there was a charge to the priests, and they were told to what? Wail, verses 13 through 14. Dress in sackcloth and mourn. Humble yourself, in other words. Spend the night crying out to God. But they were also not only for them to cry out to God. They were told to call the people together for fasting and prayer and to challenge them to cry out to the Lord. 
The whole purpose of the locust invasion, the purpose of Assyria, the purpose of Babylon, the purpose of Persia to come in and conquer them was to humble them, to bring them to their knees, to recognize that they needed God. They they had it good. They had lived a good life. They were a prosperous nation. But because of their wickedness, they had to be judged. And the lesson of the locust invasion was the picture of the day of the Lord, his terrifying judgment and destruction. And that day was a day of horrible suffering and will be a day of horrible suffering because of the famine, because of the joyful worship that was being cut off, because all grain and storage facilities were emptied and ruined. The economy collapsed because the livestock grown from lack of pasture to feed on. It's a day when true believers would cry out to God. And Lowell stood as a dynamic example, if you will, of a prayer warrior. One who interceded for others. Look at verse 19. To you, O Lord, he says, I call. To you, O Lord, I call. The fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and a flame has burned all the trees of the field. Even the beasts of the field pant for you, because the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. It was a day that when even the wild animals would cry out to God for help and relief. The coming day of the Lord is a warning to escape the coming judgment. And we see that over in chapter 2 where it mentions the day of the Lord. It says, blow a trumpet in Zion, sound alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. It's near. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness, there is spread among the mountains. A great and powerful people. Their like has never been seen before. Nor will it again after them. Through the years of all generations, fire devours before them. And behind them, a flame burns. The land is like a garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, like war horses they run, as with rumbling of chariots they leap on the tops of the mountains, like the crackling of a flame of a fire, devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Before them the peoples are in anguish. All faces grow pale like warriors. They charge their their soldiers. They scale walls. They march on each each on his own way, and they do not swerve from their paths. They don't jostle one another. They each march in his pathway. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb on the, mount, on the houses. They enter like a thief through the windows. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdrew their shining. And the Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceeding, exceedingly great. And he who ex- executes his word is powerful for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? They're saying that danger is right at hand. It was looming over them. They were threatened. They're being threatened by these armies. They're being threatened by these locusts. It was a day of darkness, of gloom, of thickness, clouds, deepest blackness. Picture of to- of just terror and hopelessness. It was a day of war. The sudden coming of the most powerful army ever was being mobilized. They would set the cities on fields on blaze. They would turn paradise or Eden into a desert. Nothing would escape its reach. They would appear with frightening war machines, horses, cavalry, chariots, and with their terrifying noise. That's hard to imagine what 
Joel saw in his vision. Because he's trying to put this vision into what he knows or what his, his experience is of the day, of horses, of chariots. But he's looking forward not only to his time period, but also into the future, into the time of revelation. And what could those things be? The war sheep machines. We don't use horses and cavalry much in our warfare, do we? We use a lot of different other things. We use tanks. We use supersonic weapons. We use missiles. We use machine guns. All those things, we can only imagine of how he would describe them in that day. And he chose these describing words because it was something that his people, the people of Israel, would understand. He's saying this army would be so organized and so disciplined that they would charge over and scale over the walls, never turning their attack. They would not uh, break ranks. They would would break through the opposing army's defenses. They'd have overwhelming forces and be invincible as they attack and conquered the city. The day of astounding signs in the heavens and the earth. Earthquakes, asteroids colliding with Earth, eclipses of the sun and the moon, stars turning pitch black. It was a day of judgment executed by the Lord himself. For he said, the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? It is he who stirs up or... Stir, leads and stirs the mighty army to be his agent of judgment. It is he who launches the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The urgent appeal for genuine sorrow and repentance, verse 12. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. You see, when bad things would happen, they would tear their garments down as an outward expression of what was going on inside their heart. And here, he's saying, don't rend your garments. Don't tear your garments. Rend your hearts instead. Let your heart be broken. Cry out before him with warning and weeping and fasting. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. He wanted the people to change their heart. The plea was to be radical, to tear your heart, to change it, to return to the Lord. Why? Because the Lord is merciful. The Lord at times turns back his judgment. The Lord may answer genuine prayer and repentance and turn away his wrath and bless the people so that they can worship him. They're saying perhaps this is what will happen if we just but turn our face back towards God. You remember the story of Jonah, don't you, in the Bible? Jonah was a prophet of God. He was told to go to the people of Nineveh. Who was Nineveh? Nineveh was the people of Iraq. It was the Persians. Before they were called Persians. But here, Jonah was told to go and preach to them. And he says, no way, I don't want to go. Because I know that you are gracious, that you are merciful, and you will... Allow them to repent. He says, I don't want that. He wanted God to destroy Nineveh. So he tries running away from God. Gets swallowed up by a big fish. Three days later, it spit out of its mouth and comes out on the desert. Goes out into the desert, sits under a plant, and the sun's heat makes that plant wither up, and he begins to curse again God. And God says, go to Nineveh. He says, no, because you know that they will repent. 
Even then, he was still not wanting to go to Nineveh. And after being scorched by the sun, he finally relinquishes, gives in to God, and he goes to Nineveh. And the people repent, and they turn to God. And the judgment that was supposed to come out upon Nineveh, God withheld his hand because they repented. My friends, that's where the world is at today. All you need to do is look around what's happening in the world. It says in the last days leading up to that great and terrible day, there would be birth pains in the world. There would be earthquakes. Our earthquakes are increasing every year. They're not decreasing, they're increasing. We not only have a thousand a year, we have several thousand a year throughout the world. They're getting stronger in intensity. It's not happening just in the United States or just in the, the, uh, the East, in Japan and China and elsewhere. It's happening all over. We see that there's wars and rumors of wars. We see the armies of China rising up, threatening to do war. We see North Korea rising up and shooting missiles across Japan and elsewhere, threatening to go to war. We see things happening in the Middle East. Iraq, Iran, Israel, Jordan, other places throughout that whole area threatening to go to war if certain demands are not met. Those are all but birth pains leading up to the great and terrible day of the Lord, leading up to what we call the time of tribulation mentioned in the, in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're about birth pains. We're seeing economies of the world falling apart. We're seeing things happen that have never happened in our lifetime. And yet the world still keeps its eyes closed, refusing to draw near to God while he can be yet found. The call is for everyone to attend, to consecrate, and to be sanctified, or in other words, to be set apart to God. Look at Joel chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even the nursing infants, let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber, between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? It's a cry for the people of God to rise up and be the people of God that they're supposed to be. The prayer warriors to take a firm stand and having putting on the full armor of God, it says having done all to stand, to stand firm in their beliefs. It's a time where we need to rise up as Christians and take a stand for our beliefs. We can no longer allow the world to go back and forth and make us toss like the wind. We need to take a stand for our beliefs. We need to build the relationships with people so we can lead them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why we participate with a community event for the Harvest Festival. They call it Halloween. I call it a Harvest Fest. Yeah, there's going to be kids, 400-plus kids, running around, 
dressed in costumes. Dressing in costumes is not a sin. Okay? But they're doing it with wrong motives, many of them. And we as Christians, what do we do? Think about it. Most of us turn the lights off at home. We go to the back bedroom. We want to turn our TV on or do something to busy ourselves so we don't have to answer the knockers at the door. When, I, when we were raising our kids, it, it was a time where we had a special night out. We went out to dinner and had a very special dinner with the kids, did something with them so that we didn't have to participate. But we need to take a stand. How else will people learn about Jesus unless we take the word of God to them? And that's what we're doing at the community event. You know what we're going to have? We're going to have all, we have a bunch of paper pumpkins cut out on cardboard. We're putting stakes in the ground. On all the walkways leading up, it's going to say, Jesus lights your way. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the light of the world. Those are things that we're having posted all over. We'll have our name proudly put out there, Christian Worship Center. They're going to know we're Christians. Jesus is the light, right? We're going to be handing out candy to them. Yeah, we're, going to, we're participating. We're handing out candy. But inside, I didn't bring one in. But we have these little tracks that we're going to be putting inside of them. Steps to Peace with God, written for kids with little cartoons and little steps that show each step to take, you know, admitting that you're a sinner. Asking God to forgive you. A simple prayer included there. And it has kids step, stepping from stone to stone, going each step along this pathway. We're giving tools for parents to witness to their own children. We're giving tools to families that may not darken the door of a church because they've gotten disillusioned and, and have left the church, but they still have a small bit of faith inside of them. And they're going to be quickened by that track. Perhaps it'll be the parent that gets saved. Even if only one person gives their heart to God, it'll be worth it all. But what is our job as Christians is to be a light in the world, shining on a hillside. Being a light for others to come to relationship with Jesus. And that's what we're going to be. We will be, I mean, there's another Christian organization, a, a, a preschool from another church will be there. But I can guarantee you, we'll be probably the only one that's passing out tracks. I can guarantee you, we'll be the only one with signs out there saying, Jesus is the light. Let your light shine. Let Jesus shine in and through you. And that's all right. I went so far to call them up and say, hey, this is what we're planning on doing. Is that all right? And you know what they said? They said, yep, go ahead. Go ahead. Pass out whatever you're passing out. You're, you're just like a, another, in their world, a, another business helping out. And just like they would send out an advertisement describing their, uh, their service that they supply for their business, we're, we can hand out whatever we want to hand out. We can talk to people. And we do talk to people. Right, John? John just, there he is. We've talked to people. We sit on the front porch passing out everything, and we're, we're talking with people as they're coming up, having a good night. 
Oh, love your costume. Seeing the excitement on kids, but we build relationships. We had a, a person that sat down, a, a gentleman came and sat down for a little over a half hour with us last year on the porch, sitting in the rocker, and we're sitting there, and he said, so, you guys are Christians. I said, yep. We're out here just sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. You know what he said? He said, I'm a Christian too. Thank you. Thank you for being a light. Now, whether he went to church or not, we don't know. But the idea that he felt comfortable enough to sit down and talk spoke volumes. And we, we met a lot of people that night. And everyone that came in said, thank you. That seems really odd, doesn't it? A church handing out candy on Halloween and being thankful that we're there doing it. And they're getting a track. I say hallelujah. I say amen. I'm looking for the day that they'll say, hey, can you pray with me about this need? Hey, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. Can you tell me a little bit more about this? I believe that's happening. I believe it's going to happen. That's what I'm praying for. That's what I'm fasting for to happen. Is that we will use these opportunities of a dark and terrible world, these birth pains of the day of the Lord coming to be an opportunity to be something that kicks us out of our chair and gets us out into the world once again to preach the gospel. If all we do is preach in churches, we're not going to get anybody saved. We need to go out into the highways and byways. And it says in the word of God to compel them. Now, you know what that word compel means? Not just push, Jeannie. It means drag him, kick him, screaming into the church. It's compelling. It's, it's forcing them to come. Now, I don't want you to go out and drag your neighbor to church. I can tell you that's not going to be an easy way to witness to him. But we need to go out and encourage people to have a relationship with God. We need to go next door and say, hey, you know what? I haven't seen you for a while in, the, in the, the neighborhood. I haven't seen you outside. Is everything okay? Is there anything that we can pray with you about? Have you been sick? Is anyone in your family sick? How's your job working? You don't have a job? Well, let's pray about it right now. And begin to pray with them. Building relationships. That's what we're all about is building what? Stronger relationships with God, each other, our community, and the world. You know, when John put that up there, when he painted it out there, it originally was supposed to say, building strong relationships with God, each other, our community, and the world. That's originally what we said. He ups and put stronger relationships. And you know what? I think that oops was the Holy Spirit. Because you never stop growing with God. Our relationship with God, our relationship with each other, our relationship with our community and our world should be growing stronger every single day. And if it's not, then we need to take a check and say, okay, what's happening? Am I getting complacent like the Israelites? Am I getting comfortable? Am I getting comfortable with my sin? Am I getting comfortable with the things of the world? The call in verse 17 was for the priests to take the, the lead in crying out. And that's why I'm challenging our church and have been challenging our church to pray, to fast for our community, our neighbors, to pray for our people inside the church that they would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need to pray that God will spare our community when the judgment is poured out 
on the great and terrible day of the Lord. We need to pray that God will keep his people from being scorned, from discrediting God's name before unbelievers. And that brings us to the wonderful promise of God to the repentant. And I'm closing here. It says in verse 18, that then the Lord became jealous for his land, and he had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you, notice what he's sending to them, grain, wine, oil, and you will be what? Satisfied. I'll meet your needs. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations, I will remove the northerner far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land. In other words, he will drive eventually these invading nations away. I will drive these locusts away. I will drive Assyria, Persia, the Babylonians away from you. his vanguard into the eastern sea, his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and the foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. Fear not, O Lord, be glad. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine give their full yield. He said, there will be a time of refreshment. There will be a time where you will be a blessing once again, and you will have the vine, the vine and the fig trees, and they'll be prosperous. And you see that when nations of Israel came back into being in 1948, taking the city of Jerusalem in 1967, when they became back as a nation, They've become very prosperous, haven't they? They've been turning the desert into a forest. Literally, they're planting trees every year in the, in the desert out there, and they're growing a forest. They're harvesting fruits and vegetables and figs and pomegranates and olives they're one of the leaders in technology in the world. Many nations are turning to them for weapons and things of that nature because they're a leader in that field, fetal field of technology. The promise of God is true. God promised to restore their material prosperity. God re promised to restore respect and honor to his people. God promised to restore peace and national security to them. He would drive back the northern armies, and he would do what? He would do it himself. It wouldn't be the people that would be doing it. It would be the Lord God himself doing it. God would restore the land, and you could read about that in Joel chapter 2. Verse 21 through 22, and Psalm 65, verses 9 through 13, or Romans chapter 8. He would provide for the wild animals. He would provide abundant fruit from both trees and vines. God would restore good weather, abundant rain, both in the spring and the fall. God would restore their food supplies that they had lost from the great famine, from these Vading locusts, he would restore them. He would fill the storage facilities and distribution centers with food. Their economy would come back and be strong. What's the purpose of the registration? Restoration, it was to stir the people back to praising God, to make sure that God's people would never again be shamed, to make sure that God's people know that he is with them, that he is the Lord and the only true and living God. And that brings us to verse 28 of chapter 2 of Joel. He says, You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. For my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no one else. 
and my people shall never again be put to shame. And it shall come to pass, verse 28, and it shall come to pass. Look at that phrase, and it shall come to pass. In other words, it will happen. In time, it will happen. What's going to happen? This is what's going to happen. He will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions, even on the male and female servants. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, and blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be darkened, turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. He's saying there will be survivors. It will come to pass that I will pour out my spirit. And that's what the purpose of the gifts of the spirit is for, is for us to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others around us. He wants us to use the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gift of miracles, signs and wonders, the gift of faith, the gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues. All those gifts, plus all the others, are there for one reason and one reason only, to reach the people for Christ. to encourage us to draw people into a relationship with him. That's why we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. He's saying, yeah, this destruction is going to come. Yes, this destruction did come in the form of locusts. It was to be a living illustration for the people of Israel to turn their lives to God, and eventually they did. But they had to go through three invasions, invasions from the Assyrians, invasions from the Babylonians, the invasion from Persia. That's what it took for them to turn their hearts back to God and become a firmly rooted people and children of God. So my question is for us, what's it going to take for us? He's saying you can't be wavering back and forth, tossed like the waves any longer. Look it up, James chapter 2, I think it is. But it's in the book of James. No longer tossed back and forth like the waves. We need to stand firm in our belief. We need to let our light shine in the world of darkness. We need to you do that by what? Using the gifts of the Spirit that he's given us to walk in the Spirit and to do his work, to do the works that he's planned ahead of us to do. There are works. That's why you're still here. That's why we haven't graduated to heaven. Russ? That's why you're still here with us, buddy. As much as we want to go to heaven, there's still a reason for us here. There is someone that we need to reach for God. Someone that God's still calling out to. Ruthie, there's still people to pray for. You might not get out there and be able to run a race, but you can pray and intercede. That's part of the call of repentance. We need to call on the name of the Lord and use the gifts on a daily basis, not just in church, but outside of church. I want to see the gifts of the Spirit move in the church setting, but I want to see them move in the community as well. I want people to come back and say, yeah, I was... uh, with my next door neighbor, and they, they said they had a, a need. They'd been sick, I, and I went over and prayed with them, and, and they came back and said that they were healed. I want to hear things like that. I want to hear that we go over and we're praying with somebody that's in a wheelchair, and they get out of that wheelchair and they walk. 
I want to hear that we've gone over to someone next door. We've been walking our daily walk through the neighborhood. And we meet somebody and we begin to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. And they accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Those are the things I want to hear. That's the vision I have for this church. That's the vision I have for this community. My vision is that I'd be walking around, just walking around the lake, and, I, and I'm getting all these calls saying, Pastor, come here, i got to tell you something. That's the vision I have for us. But it's up to each of us to do that. In order for that to happen, we all must take that step of faith and allow God to use us to partner with God to reach our community for Christ. That's why he's given us the Spirit. That's why he's given us the gifts of the Spirit. That's why we looked at the gifts. Now he's coming to the challenge. We are called to be watchmen on the wall. We're going to discuss that next week. Ezekiel 33, if you want to read about it ahead of time, go ahead. But that's what we're going to talk about next week. We're going to be looking at chapters 33, possibly 34. Until then, I'm asking you to yield yourselves to God. That means to surrender to him. Just say, God, I don't, I, I don't know what in the world I'm doing. I wouldn't even know how to start a discussion. Well, all we have to do is say, hi, friend. Hey, neighbor. You know what? Over the years, I've forgotten your name. <laughs> Let me reintroduce myself to you. If we haven't been a particular good neighbor, you know, my wife likes to watch Hallmark. Christmas shows. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. We watched one last night. And, the, and and there was one guy that he was he had suffered a stroke and he couldn't use his hand and he was a conductor of a, an orchestra. And he couldn't do anything and he was really down on himself. And in those 3 years he ended up getting divorced from his wife because she couldn't handle him being paralyzed on his arms on one of his arms. And he was taking it out on the world. And it had this neighbor that was had gone through a, a, a divorce and had a, a child, and that child was going over and kicking the soccer ball against his side of the wall. And it led into discussions, and, and he had the nickname in the community as Scrooge, being the meanie telling people they couldn't put up their Christmas trees, telling people to not do certain things, that it's dangerous. Why isn't there salt out here on the sidewalk? Someone could slip and fall. And, and uh, yeah, he was a grouch there, Zachary. Well, in through that, the, the boy was um, not telling the whole truth. His mom would ask him, are you kicking the ball against the building? No. You know, and, and it came down to where he noticed that the that the person, the, his, his mom and this neighbor, unknown to each other that they were neighbors, they started to see each other because she worked at a restaurant and he kept pop in and the relationship was building over just little things. And, and uh, well, he got his... He got mad at the, the kid, got mad at the, the guy. And when he was kicking the ball up against the building, he took the ball and kicked it at the head of the guy. And he told, he told his mom that that didn't happen. Well, make a long story short, um, they found out that they were neighbors and they confronted each other and it didn't go well. But the kid noticed that when his mom in the days before, he didn't know that that was the person she was seeing. And she was happy when she was with him. And he went next door, the boy went next door without his mom's knowledge and confessed everything to the neighbor. That relationship was restored. And he found out that the guy used to play soccer in college and he was a champion in college. So he got 
extra lessons and all that. And I, I say all that is that we may have offended our neighbor and may, may be that we need to go to our neighbor and fess up to it. <laughs> that may be what leads them into a relationship with Christ. Those are hard choices, but that means we got to take the hard choices, the higher pathway, if you will. We need to take the steps and live our Christian beliefs out in and through our lives. Amen. Amen. Well, Father, we thank you for the study of your word. Thank you for helping us understand the challenges that Israel was facing and how they rebelled against you and how what you had to do to get their attention to reach their country and their community back to you. Lord, help us to reach our community, our family, our neighbors. Help us to bring them into a relationship with you, Father. That may mean that we need to get out of our comfort zones and go over to them and well, it may even mean that we need to ask for forgiveness. But just as we know that you forgive us as we forgive others, Lord, help us to forgive those that have hurt us in the past. Help us to share the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, with our neighbors and our friends and family and and allow them to experience that same forgiveness that we've experienced with you. Lord, help us to get out of our comfort zones and to seek your face, to pray for our community, to pray for our church. Help us to yield ourselves to be baptized in your Holy Spirit daily, Father. And if we've never been baptized at all in your Holy Spirit, help us to seek after you while you might yet be found. Help us to call upon you, Father, for perhaps in due time you will turn and heal our land as we seek you once again. Heal our relationships. Heal our community. And pour out your Spirit once again. And Lord, as always, we pray that you will bless us and keep us. That you will shine your face upon us and be gracious to us. That you'll turn your face towards us and give us peace. Go, my friends, into your harvest field, into your mission field. Go in the blessings and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ and do the works that he's planned ahead of you to do. God bless you. I look forward to hearing those good reports in the days ahead. God bless you. If you're interested in putting together some of the candy bags and all that, at least what's been turned in, see my wife. She'll get you started with that. Next week is last Sunday that we can bring candy in if you wanted to do help in doing that.